Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship Almighty God. Welcome back to Julius Shia. It's good to have you back. He finished his freshman year at the University of Austin, Texas. University of Texas, Austin. There we go. Got it right. Second try. Um, most things were online, but at least he had two classes that were in person, and he's hoping in the fall that they'll be back to completely in person now that once people are completely vaccinated. So, welcome. Good to have you back. Matthew is on vacation this week. He's in Florida visiting grandparents, and so we wish him well. Any other announcements? Then let's turn, uh, I'll, I'll mention it now. Um, Luella will have surgery on uh, the 20th, yes. uh, removing the thyroid. So we'll keep Luella in our prayers. Let's turn in our bulletin to our call to worship responsively. Psalm 85, beginning at verse 8. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Surely, Surely his, his salvation, salvation is near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness brings forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Let us join in our hymn of praise, number 207, We Have Come to Join in Worship. If you're able, let us stand. Cleanse us, O oh God, 
that we might stand in your presence. You chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before you. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail to confess our sins, allowing it to stain us and separate us from you. You adopted us as your children through our faith in Jesus' death and resurrection. Forgive us, O God, when we take Christ's sacrifice for granted with words or actions that deny our participation in your kingdom. You guarantee our inheritance through the presence of your Holy Spirit within us. Forgive us, Lord, when we do not allow the Spirit to guide and direct us in your will and your way. Hear us now as we lift our personal confessions in silence. People of God, in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Rejoice, receive, and live in the forgiveness we have in Christ. And let us join our voices in the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amos 
Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people, Israel. From Paul's letter to the Ephesian Christians, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of faith, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory and from the Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter beginning at the 14th verse. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once, the girl hurried in to the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, 
but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing and understanding of God's holy word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Whatever happened to John the Baptist? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all begin the Gospel of Jesus Christ with the account of John's ministry, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John identified Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and said, the reason I came baptizing with water is that he, that is Jesus, the Messiah, might be revealed to Israel. John baptized Jesus and said, I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Sometime after Jesus' baptism, the Gospels don't tell us how long, John rebuked Herod, that is Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, and the ruler of Galilee and Perea throughout Jesus' lifetime. Herod had divorced his wife, Phaselis, because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Ah, the intrigue, whom Herod married. John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have her. And according to Leviticus, unless the brother was dead and died childless, a brother could not marry a sister-in-law. Philip was still alive. As a result, Herod arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison. Meanwhile, Jesus had sent his 12 disciples out, and they preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed people, sick, many sick people with oil and healed them. King Herod heard about this. That's where we started our gospel lesson this morning. For Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers at work in him, within him. Others said he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard of Jesus and the disciples healing, he said, John, the man I beheaded has been raised from the dead. Imagine, Mark identified Herod, whose ancestors were Jewish converts, as one who now believed in a physical resurrection. The Gospel of Mark gives us the most detailed account of what happened to John the Baptist as a flashback to Herod's birthday party. Herodias, who married her brother-in-law, Herod Antipas, while her husband Philip was still alive, nursed a grudge against John because of his criticism of Herod's relationship with her. As a result, Herodias wanted to kill John, but she was not able to, do, able to because Herod feared John and protected him. 
knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. John preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He challenged Israel to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. When Herod heard John preach, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. But Herod would not repent of the sin of marrying Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. It has been said many people use mighty thin thread when mending their ways. Now as a quilter, Muriel, you will know there, that thread comes in different thicknesses. Embroidery thread is very thin. The thread that we use to sew seams together, a little thicker. The thread we use to quilt the top, thicker yet. What kind of thread do we use mending our ways? George H. Gallup, in an article in Leadership Magazine entitled Vital Signs, wrote, there is little difference in ethical behavior between the church and the unchurched. Just as much pilferage and dishonesty among the church as the unchurched. And I'm afraid that applies pretty much across the board. Religion per se, Gallup wrote, is not really life changing. People cite religion as important, for instance, in overcoming depression, but it doesn't have primacy in determining behavior. Unfortunately, that's true. And the further away from a commitment to God through a church that people get, the further away from godly lifestyles they get. I think that's one of the reasons we have the exceptional rates of violence in society that we have these days. People have abandoned God in their lives. Herod, like the Pharisees, feared that the popular support of John the Baptist as a prophet might cause civil unrest and be hazardous to his continued reign should Herod, Herod execute John. So Herod protected John, but Herod refused to repent when John confronted him about Herodias. Have you or I ever been conflicted, wanting, yet not wanting to hear something that deep inside we knew was true? Like Herod, when we choose not to hear words of truth, choose not to repent, we harden our hearts against God's leading and direction. Wicked is as wicked does. <coughs> In his book, I Surrender, business leader, speaker, and best-selling author Patrick Morley writes that the church's integrity problem is in the misconception that we can add Christ to our lives, but not subtract sin. It is a change in belief without a change in behavior. It is revival without reformation, without repentance. Do we add Jesus but fail to subtract sin? Like Herod, wicked is as wicked does. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias, whom Josephus, a first century historian, identified as Salome, came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. Herod's lustful appreciation for his niece, now stepdaughter, led to the imprudent over-the-top offer. 
The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. As if the offer of anything she wanted wasn't enough, Herod promised with an oath, whatever you ask for, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. Wicked is as wicked does. Three boys in the schoolyard were bragging about who had the best father. The first boy said, my dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. He calls it a poem, and they give him $100 for it. The second boy said, oh, that's nothing. My dad scribbles a few words on a piece of paper. He calls it a song, and they give him $1,000 for it. The third boy said, my dad's even better than that. He scribbles a few words on a piece of paper, calls it a sermon, and it takes four men to collect all the money. <laughs> was wealthy. He could afford to give half of his kingdom, but money was not what Salome asked for. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Bragging, like those three boys bragging, typically gets us and potentially others in trouble. Because of Herodias's grudge, Herod's bragging before his officers and high officials certainly got him and John the Baptist in trouble. You may have heard the saying, holding a grudge is like letting someone live rent-free in your head. Do we carry a grudge because of some hurt or criticism? Herodias wanted John the Baptist gone, but Herod didn't. Unintended consequences may result from grudges, pride, bragging, or our weakness to stand against injustice. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. While distressed means greatly grieved, exceedingly sorrowful, Herod refused to stand against an unjust request. He refused again to repent. In his desire to maintain his public image, Herod shamefully agreed to the request. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. Wicked is as wicked does. In a gospel where Mark gives no details of Jesus' birth, very few details of Jesus' baptism, one verse, Jesus' temptation, two verses, Mark highlighted many details, many details about what happened to John the Baptist, because John spoke truth to power. In this wicked is as wicked does account, Mark teaches us, first, we must recognize right from wrong, in spite of people's motives or intentions, and do the right thing. Second, Following Jesus, the one true King of Kings, will cost us our pride, 
our grudges, definitely our bragging, our ego, and perhaps even our lives. But doing the right thing is the right thing. Third, speaking impulsively, imprudently, ill-advisedly can lead to unintended consequences. We must always consider our words and actions, now more than ever. Jesus invites us into his kingdom to live not as we want, but a different life as God wants. Not wicked is as wicked does, but a holy life through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and Lord. Amen. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. As we continue in a spirit of worship, let us offer ourselves and our financial gifts to God. The usher will receive the morning offering. so that you might heal this nation of COVID-19. 
God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you call our neighbors near and far, those in need, into a new family. Open the hearts of all people to receive your gift of life through Jesus' death and resurrection. Speak your word of provision to the hungry, the homeless, the jobless, and the underemployed. To the sick, the sorrowing, the grieving, and the dying, speak your word of healing and comfort. To the mentally, emotionally, and physically challenged, bring your word of renewal and restoration. To the abused or abandoned, exploited or manipulated, speak your word of release and healing. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you call your church into a new family. Open the hearts of all people to receive your gift of life through Jesus' death and resurrection. Speak your word of rebirth to every denomination, that every pastor might proclaim with power the love of Christ. Give to all who call Grace Church their spiritual home a new dedication to you through worship and grace. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you call our extended family of faith into a new family. May our young couples, individuals, and families respond to the Lord's call on their lives. May our couples praise you, O God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed them in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. May everyone here and those unable to be among us remember God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Muriel, Henry, Joe, Joanne, Jeff, Luella, Dave, Julius, Gary N, Sandy J, Babs, Louise, Chris F, Betsy, Emma, Jean, Marion, Cliff, Caroline, Tina, Matthew, Anthony, Todd G. Remind those we care about who are struggling or just trying to move forward. God predestined them to be adopted as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given them in the one he loves. Luella's family, DJ, Megan, granddaughter, Caitlin, Jeff's friend, Mark's father, Peter, Karen's friends, Faith and Dale, Karen Kay's father, Maurice in England and Kate, James and Christy and grandson, Henry, Muriel's friend, Eileen, Grandchildren Katie and Ryan, daughter Jill, son Bob and Kim, Karen's sons Joel, Scott, and Nia, Joanne's daughter Andrea, fiance Adam, son Thomas and Christy, grandchildren Lucas, who's a bit overwhelmed as he ends high school, and twins Oliver and Eve, nephews Sean and Michael, sister Diane, our missionaries Adam and Janelle, Elle, sons John, Jonathan, and Thomas. Remind those we love facing life-threatening illnesses or grieving the loss of loved ones that in Christ they have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that God lavished on them with all wisdom and understanding. Karen's cousin Tina and family on her husband Jerry's passing. Karen's friend Carol and her husband Steve's passing. Carol, Kurt, and the extended Davis Wendt family on Ellie's passing. Anna's friends Yvonne and Judy, Kristen, and Donna's five-year-old son Jack, Zach, all facing cancer. Muriel's family on the death of her brother-in-law, Bill H. The Nelson, Jensen, Holt, and Swanson families on Pam's passing. Luella's friend Roberta, whose husband passed away. Cheryl on her dear friend Denise's passing. Chris F. and his family on his grandfather's passing. Dave, Roger, and all the family on Marge's passing. The Simpson family on Robert Paul's 
us in. Lord, lay your healing hand on the level. That as the surgeon does her work on Thursday, on the 20th, that you would be present to give healing throughout her body. Hear us now as we lift the silent prayers we hold in our hearts to your throne of grace.